Okay, well, this is uh, this is a live Zoom meeting, and I'm recording it. Uh, I will post it. Um, and this is the last DSD lecture for the year, for the semester, and really for the year. Um, and I'm just going to again talk about some of the uh, some of the things for the final. Uh, so I went over part of this. Let's see. And I think actually uh, I've covered most of this. Uh, Let's see. Mm, let me pull this up. And I think I will, I think I will share my screen here. And um, so yeah, so this was the final from 18, and, and the questions are going to be similar. Um, uh, so it's good. Uh, let's see, maybe I'll stop the share. Hey, Sherilyn. So I'm glad to have one other person. You can share your video if you want, so I can see your smiling face. Oh no, I thought there was a live session. I thought more people would join by now. Well, I know, I, I started a little late, so I may have missed some, but- uh, I, I just like getting out of bed. <laughs> oh my goodness. It's so awkward. <laughs> yeah, all right. Well, you do have a smiling face, so that's oh, very no. nice. Was, was Monday session like this as well? Uh, there were maybe, maybe five or six people, something like that. Okay. Yeah. I had to like go drop off my mom in the morning and it's like, it's 45 minutes away from here. It's, it's... yeah. A bunch of driving. <laughs> yeah. I was like, okay, I'm going to sleep in today. And I woke up and I'm like, oh no, live sessions. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is the last one. Okay. Okay. So good. I don't know if anybody else will join or not, but ask a lot of questions. Oh no, <laughs> I haven't even started studying for the final. Oh, no, it's okay. You you already know most of the material. It's not it, this yeah. isn't this isn't one where you have to kill yourself studying. If you know if you've done the labs, you should be pretty familiar with it. So, all right. So I'm going to share my screen, and then. Uh, yeah. Perfect. All right. So, okay, so here we go. So let's see, I'll move my little thing so I can kind of see. So yeah, that should be good. I hope that, oh yeah, yeah, let me adjust that just a little bit. All right, yeah, that's not bad. Okay, all right, so good. Yeah, so, okay, so, um, so basically, you can see. So these are the kinds of questions, and and uh, they'll be they'll be pretty similar to this. Uh, mm -hmm. But I, I'll, you know, I'm, I'm ask them a little differently. But the things I want to cover, and I kind of went through this a little bit on Monday, so I'm this is kind of a repeat. But but uh, basically, so just the reason for the language based tools, and I know I gave an example the other day, but I'll repeat it because I don't know how many people even reviewed that. But the latest NVIDIA chip has about 2 billion transistors on it, maybe 4 billion, I can't remember exactly. Mm -hmm. And I did a little math. If you, if you drew a schematic of the 4 billion transistors and each one took one, uh, square uh, one square inch to draw the circuit for that transistor, then how many square inches would you need to represent 4 billion transistors? And it turns out you need a piece of paper one mile on each side, you need a square mile of paper. Right. And if you think about that, how could anybody, first off, there's no such thing as a square mile piece of paper. Uh, that's a pretty big one. And, yeah. And then, you know, how could you sit there and draw those? Let's say you had an, one engineer, maybe you're the boss and you hire this guy and you say, I want you to draw a schematic with two, well, 4 billion transistors on it. And uh, we're going to allocate a square mile for you. We've rented a square mile of land somewhere in Texas and we poured concrete 
and we put out a piece of paper and we want you to go draw the, the schematic for each of these 4 billion transistors. And let's say it takes you, um, let's say it takes you, oh, you know, maybe say, say three or four minutes to draw each transistor. How, how long is it going to take that engineer to get this done? Too long. Yeah, Too let's long. do that. Let's, let's do this. Look, just, just you, to sort of make that <laughs> Yeah, what do you, what do you, take a guess when you, we'll do the calculation. What do you think it's going to come out in terms of? Four billion chances to like. Say four, so four billion, four, zero, 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 times four minutes. So it's 16 trillion hour, uh, 16 trillion minutes, divide by 60. Right. So that's. Uh, 266 million hours and divided by 40 hours in a week. Oops, did I do that right? Uh, let's see. Um, yeah, divide by 40. I guess that's right. Let's see. So that's, that's, uh, so that's something I screw that up somehow. Okay, let's do that again. So 4 billion. Okay, that's 4 billion times four minutes each. So that's that's 16 uh, trillion minutes divided by 60 minutes to an hour. So that's 266 million and then divide that by 40. So that's 6 million work weeks and then divide that by 52. Oh, really 50 because you don't take off a little. So that's 133,000 years. Wow, it's so off. I really said like five days. <laughs> 133,000 years. That's for your project. Would... Yeah, so how likely is that engineer going to get that done? Yeah, unless your generations, generations do it. Yeah, I mean, that almost goes back before the time of Christ. <laughs> oh, wow. So, so I mean, if you'd... That... Very possible. <laughs> yeah, if you'd started it when the Roman Empire fell, you'd just about be getting it done. Uh, no, 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 no. I that no, no, no. That's back in the dinosaur. That's pre-life. That's pre-human life. I think. You said two hundred. It's one hundred thirty-three thousand. One hundred thirty-thousand. Okay. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking one point three thousand. No, one hundred thirty-three thousand. Three hundred thirty-three years. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot of lifetimes. So let's let's figure out average productive lifetime is 40 years. Divide that by 40. So that's 3,333 lifetimes. Yeah. So this really shows us why we need English language or our language based tools to do these designs. They're just not possible any other way. Right. <laughs> it's pretty amazing, right? It is. Wait. So when was HLA created? Like how, how long ago was that? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, they've been around since, well, the 90s anyway, maybe before then. I mean, when they first started making the big chips, they had them uh, mm -hmm. because they really can't. They, the process of, of making integrated circuits, the, the, very, the, the big ones, VLSIs, that all really started when they codified, when they basically came up with these design rules for, for um, really regimenting uh, how all the parts had to be basically identical. And so they sort of came up with rules and, and they just turned it into this very logical building block kind of thing where mm -hmm. you didn't have to think about the individual transistors. You could just put together the building blocks. And, uh, and, and then the reason we can do these super complicated chips now is because we have all the IP that does most of the functionality. And then you just, let's say you want 150 cores, well, you just replicate it 150 times. All right. And then the synthesizer keeps track of all the details and puts it all together. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, you know, if we didn't have that, we'd be done. <laughs> we, we simply couldn't do half, most of the things we have now, we wouldn't exist. It's already hard enough. I'm like, I could not imagine if we did it. <laughs> it's crazy, right? Right, it is. All right, so these tools allow design at behavior level, thus many different algorithms can be explored. Yeah, and that's another really nice feature. You can try different ways of thinking about the problem 
and then you can you can go ahead and do a pre-synthesis simulation or even a post-synthesis simulation and see yeah is this going to work mm -hmm. and uh, of course for some of these even with the fancy programs and fast computers it takes you know it may take a week for it to actually synthesize or maybe longer right right um, but so what you do, you check out the individual modules and then you just put them together in the final steps. Um, so language based tools make it easier to integrate third party IP into a design. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's one of their real powers is you can take what's already been done and that's been done debugged and we know it works and you can just integrate it and you don't have to go back and reinvent the wheel. Right. As synthesizers improve designs in HDL can be done at higher levels of abstraction. Yeah. That's that's right. You you can you don't have to draw that individual transistor circuit. You can write high level descriptions of what you want it to do, and the synthesizer is going to put all that together for you. Right. The ability to simulate a design before it's turned into hardware saves costs. Oh my God, yeah. I mean, every time you make a bad integrated circuit and you have to start over again, you're burning one hundred and fifty thousand dollars or more, maybe. So you really don't want to screw it up. You want to get it right the first time. Maybe even more than that, but it, it's expensive. HDLs allow designers to focus more on the overall architecture instead of low-level details. Yeah, that's right. They really do let you think about what it is you want the device to do more than, you know, the, the low-level details of how to get it done, because the synthesizer is going to take care of a lot of that for you. Uh, new HDLs are, are being developed. Yeah, like System Verilog, System C, and others. Yes. So the, the integrated development environments. They have these associated third-party libraries that have uh, a lot of uh, intellectual property that can be added. Yes, simulation can be done only after the synthesizer is completed. No, you can do pre-synthesis simulation and post-synthesis simulation. You can see where the router and placer puts your design in the FPGA. Yeah, <clears throat> generally you can. I mean, it doesn't give you a lot of control over it and not necessarily a lot of detail. There are a few more tools for dealing with clock lines, but in general, you just have to let the synthesizer do its thing. But you can sort of see it. it gives you that little picture, you know, you've seen it where it kind of shows you the chip and it shows you where it lights up, where it used the, the, the various slices and the, this, the complex logic blocks, right? Right, right. So it is, it, you could see the uh, router in place. You can, yeah. Okay. It's just not super, you know, no. You can't do it. You don't have a lot of control over it, but you can right. see it. Bovado can, uh, syntax checking is built into the editor. Yeah, as you type in your code, it checks to see if the syntax is right. That doesn't help you with the logic, but it does tell you that you've at least syntactically done everything like you should. Right. Uh, thanks, honey. Bovado can generate all the photo maps to make an integrated circuit. Yep. Well, no, not Bovado. I mean, Mentor Graphics, Cadence, they can. Vivado, though, only generates bit files for Xilinx FPGAs and oh, okay. CPLDs. No photo mask for Vivado. That's right, because it's okay. only for make it's only for the Xilinx products. Okay, I, I didn't know that. I don't okay. <laughs> yeah. So the following statements <clears throat> uh, about hardware design. <clears throat> so very complex ICs are rarely created without using prior IP. Yes, you know. Some somebody did the math code processor many years ago, back in the back in the late '80s, and and they probably they probably have tweaked it a little bit, but they haven't really changed it. And uh, so now they just incorporate that when they make a core uh, or they provide that. I don't know. I don't know if they have a math code processor for every core, or if they just have, you know, or maybe they just have one or two of them. I'm not sure. That's really a bit interesting thought, but um, but they're not going to. But if they do, they're just going to create multiple copies of it. They're not going to redesign it from scratch. And um, so, yes, we don't make complex ICs without start standing on the shoulders of a lot of stuff that's already been done. HDLs were first used to make ICs and later adapted to do simulation. No, no, other way around. In fact, they were really started just to do documentation, then simulation, and then finally to actually synthesize. That was the last step. Okay. Wait, um, with 13, um, you, wait, you do use IPs for every IC, right? That, that's true, correct? For 13? So, yeah. In other words, in other words, let's say you're going to make a, you're going to make a, say a, a fancy microprocessor. So mm -hmm. you wanted it to have floating point capability. So right. you want to have a floating point uh, engine. 
So you you just license or you'd get that IP from someplace and you would use that along with, and then you probably go license an ARM core. So you'd license an ARM core, you'd license a coprocessor, and then you just kind of put together your fancy bus and maybe your memory interface and how you're going to do all that. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't reinvent the wheel. You would never just start from scratch for a real right. complicated design. Right, um, right. <clears throat> and obviously the synthesizer has a lot of primitives built into it. So it already knows, you know, what an AND gate is, an AND gate, an OR gate, an exclusive OR gate, a MUX, a lookup table. It already knows all that stuff. Right. So you wouldn't have to ever redesign those simple things. Yeah, I didn't read the part saying using prior IP. I see that. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. One of the keys, yeah, and reading the questions carefully is always a good thing. <laughs> yes. One of the keys to good design, break out into sub-modules separate logical parts of a design. Yeah, absolutely. That's exactly what we want to do. Uh, we want to we want to modularize the design so we can we can actually get um, uh, you know we can we can think about different parts of it. Like for instance, in the stuff we're doing, we want to uh, what we want to do is we'd want to go ahead and say have a module that's gonna all we have to do is give it what we want to show on each of our seven digits in an array, and that's that's basically how we do it. And uh, and you can do it so so that you're given the array four bits for every display. Well, that four bits, and you can you can have a hex digit, right? right. But you can't have an arbitrary uh, bit pattern in the in the seven segment display like the like option four would, would require if you did that game, where mm -hmm. you have to show you know funny patterns. In fact, if, if you think about a seven segment display, how many different how many different patterns can you display on a seven segment display? Including, say, the the decimal point. Um, there's like a hundred. Is there? So, so if you have seven segments and what and a decimal point, you have eight different things you can control. Right, right. With, so, what's with, two to the eighth? Decimal point, right? Yeah. Right. So that's really the eighth bit. So, what's two to the eighth? Sixteen. Two to the eighth is two fifty six. Oh, sixty four. Sorry, sixty four. <laughs> no, no, two fifty six. Two two to the power of eight is two fifty six. Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> Waking up in the morning, little. Brain That's okay. <laughs> so two hundred and fifty six different things. Okay. Yes. All right. I was like, that it's so, okay. In the so a seven seven segment display can display two different versions of the entire ASCII character set. Okay. 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 But We're you would have to spend a lot of time memorizing the patterns because they wouldn't look right 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 you know they'd be totally funny things yes correct correct yes. so in fact if you just do the letters you you know you, you can get up to maybe j k is really hard to do um and then there are a bunch of letters that just don't work very well in a seven segment display i should mess with it before i give you the board back <laughs> yeah yeah. Yeah. Well, you, well, you should look at like the fourth options, kind of that. Mm, okay. Yeah. I, we've been, I worked with the first uh, option for the project. With yeah. the and we've actually gotten very far. The, it's just the only part we cannot get is the borders and the collisions. Oh, really? So working yeah. on that. Still working cool. on that. And I don't know if we can't, we have a working game. It's just the fact that like if yeah. it does get out of the game, it doesn't quit. Like it'll just come back around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's that's fine. Like I said in that, in that description, you know, if you just get, you know, if you just get a display and something working, that that's. I mean, mm. it's nice if you can figure out some other things too. But right. that's 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 all you have to do. And I, I wanted to ask you on advice on like how we would, you know, how we can approach that maybe. Yeah. Um, so so I haven't actually done one of those, but but obviously. You know, you have a variable that tells you which, you know, where the where the ball is or where the you know the little pipper is, and mm -hmm. and you're you're when it when it when it's congruent with your definition of the borders, then you know it's hit the border. So you you just have to check for that. I think it's maybe because we haven't maybe defined the borders correctly yet. I, I don't know. There's something yeah. with yeah, yeah, it's not working right. So. Yeah, so you so you have an x and a y value, and the x value has to stay within a certain range, right. and and when it hits that border, and maybe what you need to do is move the borders in a little bit, so they're not right at the limit. Okay. Because you could have the border defined in a way that it never hits it. 
without mm. flipping around on the other side. I don't know what we are like. And then I, I kept messing with it yesterday and then all of a sudden I couldn't generate my code and I was like, okay. <laughs> like, right, right. Time to take a nap. <laughs> yeah, sometimes. It, the collision that you might. Um, yeah. Like how, 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 to get, how to get that working. Yeah, so you just, so somewhere, so somewhere at, every time you update the position, you, you have to have an if statement in there that checks for all the borders. Mm. You know, is the X equal to this left border or is the X equal to, the, or is it, is it still less than this border? Is it still greater than that border? Is it still less than the top, bit greater than the bottom for right. the Y? I'll definitely try to keep messing with that. Hopefully we can get something more. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a great exercise for you to think through that stuff though. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's All definitely right. To get because like my whole group like it's 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 really good like I like my group but the thing is it's harder to do projects online now you know oh, so know. everybody this has not been easy yeah no definitely not like I have like a couple other projects this semester and if you don't know your group members you you don't communicate well yeah so like everyone in our group did their own codes <laughs> but yeah. everyone had like some error and I'm like if we could just communicate better yeah it could like work itself out but it, it's hard i get it everyone's busy this time of the semester but yeah. hopefully we'll get something working better today yeah no that's right it's it is hard it, and i know you know and and because you're home you get asked to do other things and yeah. um you know yeah. it, it's hard and 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 i know you know yeah and we're going to have another semester like this apparently so even though the vaccines are coming out this i guess they're being distributed they're shipping they've shipped already i guess so oh it's like i i just honestly i've stopped looking at the news about it i'm like is the vaccine out it's actually like confirmed out now yeah they've they've uh, they've approved at least the pfizer astrazeneca one i think is approved Interesting. Uh, and it's been shipped i think they the factory i think was in europe and they've shipped i i think i think the government pre-bought a couple couple of hundred million doses or something Mm, okay. And they've been okay. even when they started the phase three trial, they were still they were been producing the vaccine, in the okay. in the assumption that it was going to be approved. So, but it's still going to be like this next year, though, right? <laughs> well, I think I, I I think I think it's gonna, I I think probably in the next week or so they're going to be administering it, in some locations, and they'll be shipping it out. So, and and they're going to try and do the high risk people first, you right. know, nursing homes. And then first responders and and you know hospital folks, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and then and and then I guess I'll work from there. But I yeah. think it's going to be available rapidly to everybody. I don't think it's I don't think we're going to have to stand in a long line. Right. Um, well, that's that'd be interesting to go back to everything next year. Like, it, well, it's my you know, I the the question is, you know, I, the university's not prepared. They yeah. they haven't really done contingency plans that I'm aware of. So they're going to basically just start like we're still in COVID lockdown. So I oh, don't know. Oh, next semester. That's that's the plan now. Mm, okay. Yeah, so I don't I, know because most the classes it's the same thing as last year. They'll have a location time, but I'm like, with everything going on, is UTSA really opening up, or I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. <laughs> I know you wanted your labs to be opened up, like it, like especially with DSD and stuff. I it. It is yeah. a lot more useful in person, I for sure. Yeah, no question. I, I mean, the students can't get the help, you know. Right, no. You're, you're doing it at home, it you get stuck, happen. and what happens? You give up. Yeah, no, like Alex was definitely helpful a lot this semester. Like, yeah. he really took all of his resources to, and like, I was able to show up a couple of times over the uh, semester. So, like, that helped a lot. But yeah. yeah, Alex has been, yeah, if we'd had a bad TA, it would have been a total disaster. Yeah, yeah. He was very understanding and he was really like willing to teach, which made it a lot easier. Yeah, I think it's been a good, I think it's been a good experience for Alex too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's kind of shouldered some real responsibility. So it's been good. <laughs> um, so, uh, okay, let's see. Um, there's several HDLs. Uh, so it's good to break things into modules. You want to do that. Right. And there are several HDLs. If the Verilog syntax is correct, then you can guarantee the code will correctly synthesize. No, not at all. Uh, there's there there are things that you can do with the code that are logically impossible to synthesize. Right. General differences in writing good HDL code and C++ code. Uh, so are the topic of this next group. So you should 
you should think in steps, your steps should be kind of serial with your C code, but you have to think in parallel with HDLs. So when you write, you know, say three combinational statements, they all are executing all the time, continuously, simultaneously. Your always blocks are always being triggered whenever signals in the sensitivity list are triggering. So you, so you have to think in a very different way. Uh, if you have a clock and a sensitivity list, then that means that sensitivity, that, that, that always block is executing maybe 100 times a second. I mean, maybe 100 million times a second. So that's fast. And yeah, it, it, whereas when you're thinking about a microprocessor, yeah, it's executing instructions very quickly, but it's doing them step one, step two, step three. It's a little easier to stay on top of that. It's harder to think in parallel, even though our brains are actually parallel devices. So go figure. <laughs> our, our consciousness is a serial thing, oh, but our brains are massively parallel devices. Oh. In fact, the, pro, the, the propagation delay on a neuron is probably 20 milliseconds. <laughs> I love that. I love that's how you do it. <laughs> Compare that with nanoseconds for a typical AND gate. You really know how to turn everything into logic, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Well... <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, I definitely, you know, I think I was probably a better doctor than I am an engineer, but I definitely, I definitely think in terms of engineering terms, because mm -hmm. I was okay, an engineer doctor. for a bunch of medical school. Okay, What's that? Did you do? Uh, OBGYN. Oh, wow. And then you went from that to engineering? No, I, I got my PhD during medical school in my first year of residency. Oh, okay, wow. That's a switch in topics, but that's awesome to know. Set, set of skills right there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, yes, if, if there's ever a dichotomy between between the, uh, the engineering world and uh, the medical world, yeah, gynecology is definitely uh, probably You're one of the bigger ones. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. That's really cool, though. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's uh, yeah. Do you still do any of the, do you still? Like I, I haven't seen patients for about two years. Okay. So I, I was still seeing some patients uh, up till about two years ago. And then I, I've really, I, I've, it was kind of, it just became more, well, the office I was seeing them in, uh, they, they closed it down and moved to a new location and, and it didn't really work out for me to switch. So mm -hmm. that's when I finally quit. I, had, I closed my full-time private practice in 2013. You had so, a full, that is amazing. Yeah, wow. I practiced medicine for 30 years. Wow, okay. And then you went into teaching or? Well, I, I taught, a, I, even, even, even when I was doing that, I, I, you know, I was teaching residents. So I was chairman of our department at BAMC. So we oh. had, I had 24 physicians working for me and 24 residents. So, oh. so 50, 50 physicians working for me. So college students are like nothing. You're like, ah. You know, you know, <laughs> Sherilyn, teaching residents is one of the most difficult and frustrating things you can do. I'm one, sure. they're, 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 they're kind of arrogant, in all honesty. I mean, you know, you have to have a little bit of a big head to, to be surgically inclined. When you yeah. take a knife and cut somebody's belly open, mm -hmm. it takes a lot of confidence to do that. Mm -hmm. And um, just a lot of, you know, I mean, you just have to be very confident in, in your abilities and what you know. Right. So, that, that suggests there's probably a bit of an ego thing going on, right? And, and then, you know, because they're in training, as a staff, you're sort of responsible to keep them from killing the patient. Mm. So, so they need to learn, they need to do things, because otherwise we'll never have new doctors. But by the same token, they don't for sure really know what they're doing yet. So you, you have to keep them, you have to keep the patient safe, and you also have to, to give them space to learn. And it's really challenging. And of course, uh, in, in the whole thing, they tend to think they know more than you do and they have this big ego and you're constantly deal, having to deal with that. <laughs> just like engineers, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I, engineers aren't like that. <laughs> not I mean, too bad, not too bad. <laughs> no, no, especially, you know, undergraduate students, I mean, some of them have a little arrogant attitude, most not, you know, mm -hmm. I think engineers are pretty, are, most engineers are very realistic because you know yeah. they deal in the world of real. Right, right. You know when you go into political science and psychology, and you know uh, 
some of those things you're you're doing dealing with a lot of make make believe mm -hmm. yeah and uh you know art you know the picture represents what you want it to you know, <laughs> that's a good way to say it <laughs> music's a little harder core it, it it is what it is right you either played the note or you didn't yep that's true but but a lot of most of the most of the the performance arts are pretty cut and dried but but the but the fine arts they're not anyway yeah i don't know it is interesting so i do enjoy teaching i i i, I enjoy teaching engineers probably more than i did residents mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you think it's easier <laughs> a bit oh, it's, more? yeah it's definitely it's definitely not as well i mean i you know i mean there are time when i've just had to say stop 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 you know we can't we can't persist you know trying to do a vaginal hysterectomy we, we, we have to stop we have to open the belly you've lost too much blood we can't find the pedicles and the patient's going to die if we don't change what we're doing oh no scary too much I, I had to stay away from the hospital field i was like nope nowhere in the middle well it's upsetting and when you're you know you know you're, you're in a position you're you're i mean you you realize that if it all goes bad you're the one that's responsible hey, that's that's terrifying it is a little bit terrifying mm -hmm. and yeah it is at least with computers you can still mess up and be okay <laughs> you guys can you guys can totally blow the component to high heaven but we're probably not going to kill anybody no no it might cost a little money but yeah right. right we may we may burn up a 184 dollar board but <laughs> yeah but we can replace that true exactly yeah yeah so it's 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 more fun and less stressful mm -hmm. yep <laughs> I mean, it is, you know, medicine is exciting. I mean, it's fun to save somebody's life. It's just a, it's a relatively rare event. Right. Most of the time it's, you know, it's the same thing over and over and it's routine and, you know, it's not life and death, but you do help people and that's wonderful. And I, you know, I, I love to help people and I, I really enjoyed my patients. I, I think the thing for me that was really enjoyable was it's, it's a, you know, it's, you know, I had very intimate relationships with a lot of women, but they were professional. You know, mm -hmm. they weren't inappropriate type mm -hmm. intimacy, but right. my patients, you know, I, I mean, you know, I, I knew things about them and they shared things with me. They would have never, you know, they would never share with anybody else in the world. Oh, yeah. And that's kind of neat. I really like that. You your own self-practice too, right? So you had the, you were like a little. Family. I did. I, I did private practice for nine years after I, yeah. after I retired from the military. Yeah. I did the military for 23 years as a physician or well. 21 years as a physician, three years as a helicopter pilot. Wow, you seem to keep amazing me, man. That's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. Would you ever still go flying if you had a chance? Well, you know, you know, flying in like Vietnam where you're getting shot at was kind of exciting. And it really? Is, <laughs> really? It's kind of fun. It is kind of fun to fly, but it is kind of, it gets kind of routine and boring, mm. you know, when you're not you know, when it's not, when there's not some reason for it to be exciting. I guess. I mean, I guess if no one's shooting at you, sure. Yeah, it's kind of boring. Oh, what a, it's too chill for me, wow, Mr. Moore. <laughs> <laughs> All right, inertial delays are for synthesis only. No, they're for simulation only. Propagation delays cannot be synthesized. Yes, that's right. Wait for 10 nanoseconds in an always loop can be synthesized. Yeah, so that's a, that's a little more complicated. Normally that 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 would usually typically occur in in a uh, you know in a test bench, but you you could theoretically do that uh, in a in your in your module and intend for it to be synthesized, and you could set it up so it could be synthesized. Oh, okay. Uh, so I so the so that would be true, uh, but it wouldn't be typical, I guess. The dollar file operator is not synthesizable. That's right. That's strictly test bench. The, you're, you're using a disk drive on a laptop. There's no disk drive hooked up to our, uh, you know, our, our, our Nexus board. Only integer types can undergo manipulation and, and multiplication and division in Vivado. Well, division is a problem. Division is not strictly defined in Verilog. Mm -hmm. So you can write a module that will do division, but you're, you're on the hook for that. It's not, it's not, most synthesizers won't do that for you. Right, right. So, so the answer, so that's really false, but only integer types can undergo multiplication. Now you can do division if it's a power of two because you can shift the bits. Mm -hmm. you, you do a right shift, you just divide it by two. Okay. 
and you do shift right shift two, you just divide it by four and so forth. Yeah, the division is something else. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's a little tricky. So I'd probably say that, you know, that's a not a great question, but it probably should be false. And then I just real quick, the propagation delays can be synthesized, right? That's true. No, 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 none of the delays. When you make it, when you, in our case, we're generating a bit file, right? That right. bit file gets loaded into the, the chip and then the chip operates at its fixed operational voltage at it, the speeds that's inherently incorporated into all of its gates. Okay. And, and your bit file doesn't change that. Now you, you can program in uh, signals and other things, clocks, and you can, you, can, you can make things operate in the time frame you want, but the individual gates are still firing at, the, at their native rate. And just because you specify a longer or shorter delay does not change the actual hardware. Okay, okay, makes sense. Okay. It's native to whatever technology is being used. Same with an integrated circuit. You know, you, once you pick what kind of NAND gates or NOR gates you're going to put on the chip, and and you know, how you know what the technology is. Is it 28 nanometer? Is it eight nanometer? You know, 150 nanometer technology, and mm -hmm. and uh, and how you're going to design the, the transistors. Uh, that's going to change what the propagation delays are a little bit, but but that's more that's a that's a lower level detail uh that you have to build into the the synthesizer you kind of have to tell it or or you pick the fault values but just because you put pound 10 or pound 15 or pound 5 doesn't change the physics right right only the simulation okay got you got you okay so here's a following code segment you can you can um so um Uh, so anyway, when you instantiate this module, you must specify, so we have a parameter uh, width, and it gives a default value of eight. So when you instantiate this module, you must specify the parameter width for the module. No, you don't have to, because it will default to eight if you don't. Mm -hmm. This is a comparator. Yeah, it, that's right. A, you know, four bits of A, four bits of B, and then you have the outputs A equal B, A greater than B, A less than B. If you don't specify a value for the width, it will equal eight bits, yes. This always block will result in sequential code. Yes, the comparator is a sequential device. It's, I mean, sorry, uh, no, that's false. It's a, it results in combinational code. Okay. A comparator is not a sequential device, doesn't have a clock. There's no clock in the port list. Right, okay. okay. Yeah, it's just like a multiplexer, adder. They're just combinational devices. So uh, a sequential device is a state machine. Yes, okay. And it involves flip-flops and other stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you instantiate this same module twice, you could use a different size for width each time. Sure, that's why you have a parameter. Right. Look at this instantiation. So comp pound 16, and then uh, the SRI is its unique in in instantiation name, and then XYEGL. Uh, so mark the correct equivalent description of the variable A and B that would be used in this module. So this, this, is, this is the correct answer. Right. 15 to, to zero, A comma B. So A and B are 16 bit vectors. Mm -hmm. And if you go back here, you see why that would be because we set those up right here. Width minus one. Well, we defined width as 16, so 15 to zero. Mm -hmm. All right. This code segment, so I, I'm not going to go over this one because it's stupid. Um, I, I probably will have some questions about blocking and non-blocking, but you remember these these are non-blocking. The equal sign is blocking in an always block. Right. So here's our always block, and uh, when you have a blocking, it's going to be it's going to fully complete execution and update the left hand variable before the next statement's executed. When you have <clears throat> non-blocking, they all fire immediately. So the A here is not the A here. It's, it's, the, it's the original A that triggers the always block. So, so if A comes in at three, then <clears throat> one plus three, the new <clears throat> when it's done, A will be updated to four. But for this, but for C, C will be three plus one also. So C and A will be four. 
you won't update a to four and then add four plus one and make C five. That's non-blocking. On the other hand, blocking, if B comes in as four, then this B will update to five and it will wait until this is complete before this one executes. So this B will be updated to five. So one five plus one will be six. So D would be six. Okay. Okay. And and sometimes you have to use blocking, uh, even in some even in when it's going to be a state machine, when it's going to be sequential. Sometimes you do, but normally you would typically use blocking when it's going to be uh, combinational, and you usually use non-blocking when it's going to be sequential. Sure. Okay. Depends on an F. Uh, depends on the FPGA. It's a BGA package. Yeah, it's a ball grid array package. Uh, so the, there's little solder balls on the bottom of the chip that connect to the actual pins. They're, they're not really pins, they're just contacts. And there's, there's 325 dots on the circuit board and that, that little chip has to be lined up perfectly using a, using a pick and place machine. Put, it puts that chip down exactly where it's supposed to go. And the little solder balls are all lined up and then they bake it and the solder balls melt and solder that chip to, uh, to the little tray to the to the solder points on the on the printed circuit board, and and if you look at the bottom of your Nexus four board, you'll see you'll see the little dots where they're plated through vias going through. It's probably a multi layer board, and mm -hmm. you can see the teeny little traces that go between those lines between those solder balls. It's amazing because you've got all these internal internal pin you know solder solder balls that have to have a pathway out so they can get connected to other things. So yeah, it's truly crazy. All right, um, in the, uh, the, con the constraint file specifies whether a pin is an input or an output. What do you think? Uh, true. Nope. Well, no, that's a top module, right? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, it took me a long time to, to understand this. I yeah. spent a lot of time staring at the constraint file trying to figure out uh, where it, where the information was to indicate whether it was an input or an output. Mm -hmm. And I could never find, I couldn't find it. And then I finally realized, oh, it's, it's in the port list of the top level module. Mm -hmm. It's not in the constraint file. Constraints Which, are just more of what is in it, right? Like what are you using kind of? Yeah. So in the top level module, when you call in an input, then, then Vavado sets the bit file that defines that that uh, that pin module to be an output or I mean a, what, whatever it was input yeah. or output yeah. but but it takes that information out of the top level module port list right Correct. not from the constraint file mm -hmm. which really surprised me in the drawing below what would the pin read when the button is pressed I can't really see that <laughs> Oh, let me make it bigger. <laughs> okay, yeah, it's, it's cool, it's cool. <laughs> so there's the FPGA pin. And here's 1.8 volts, and here's ground. And there's a resistor. And we usually, the resistor is usually about 10K. It, it, it just has to be big enough that you don't draw a lot of current when the, you know, when the button's pushed. And, and it has to be small enough that it pulls it down pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. So you wouldn't want it to be like a hundred mega ohms. Right. And you wouldn't want it to be like five ohms because mm -hmm. it'd be drawing, it'd be adding power. So what do you think? What would the pin read read when the button is pressed? Mm-hmm. Sure. As in, like, would it would it be like a zero or a one? Is that kind of what yeah. is happening? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, it's gonna be a zero. So when the button is pressed, it's gonna read zero. No, it should be reading one. Yeah, because it's gonna directly yeah. connect it to VD, VDD. Right, right, right. And when the button's not pressed, this will pull it down to ground. 
So in one of the reviews, I remember reading something just like this, but the only difference was it was like a 3.3 volt or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So the, the chip actually runs, these, these pins can be programmed at different voltages, but the core, the core of the FPGA runs at, I think it's 1.8 volts, it might even be 0.9 volts, I can't remember. Oh, well, does that, does that depend the, on the circuit or is it always one, like? It, uh, I wish I could remember off the top of my head. But whatever the core runs at, that's what it always runs at. But you can program the I/O pins to be to run at whatever voltage with the outside world you want, and then it's just it's just modified so that it's correct for the core. Okay. Okay. They've got a resistor network or something because there's very little current that flows into a gate when it's when you connect an input to the gate. Right. Okay. Okay. So, so you can do it with a resistor divider. In fact, the, the VGA port on this on this board, when they when they want to drive the like the red channel and the green channel and the blue channel on the on the VGA connector, mm -hmm. they they take they have four bits, but those four bits are turned into an analog signal. And the way they turn them into an analog signal is the higher the bit they connect to the, if they go all four bits go into one input, one analog output, I should say, or input into the VGA port. <coughs> so it's an output, I guess. And so the higher order bit is connected to that output with a 512 ohm or with a five uh, with a 500 ohm resistor, and the 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 bit uh, so that's bit three. Bit two, say red two, is connected with a 1k resistor. Red one is connected with a 2k, and red zero is connected with a 4k resistor. So so the resistors. Uh, give, give a lot more, uh, the, the higher order bit contributes a greater amount of, of voltage to the final voltage that that pin's driven by and in decreasing order by powers of two. Okay, interesting, interesting. Yeah, and that's how they did it. They just used, they just used fixed resistors mm -hmm. and they just tied them all together. And, and because the red, the red input doesn't take a lot of current, that works pretty well. So if it drew a lot of current, then the voltage drop across the resistors would be all different for different amounts of current. It would screw everything up. Right. But, uh, but with very, very small current, you, it preserves that ratio pretty well. Right. Okay. That's kind of cool. All right. Um, you should consider debouncing this input. Yeah, it's always good to think about mechanical buttons bouncing. Okay. Yeah. So you can do that in a number of different ways. You can just put a delay. You can put a, you can have it drive a flip-flop and then the flip-flop's clocked. So, so there's no way it's gonna change till the next clock. And you could read the flip-flop before the next clock and you can make the clock to the flip-flop such that most of the bouncing should go away before the next clock hits. You would not need to set any internal pull-ups or pull-downs. What do you think? Not for this one, right? That's right, because you've already got one. Right. The main reason for having pull-ups and pull-downs is to avoid a floating pin. Uh-huh, okay. If the resistor to ground were missing, what would the pin read when the button's pressed? So take away the resistor. So then it would just be zero? So when the button's pressed, you still connect the pin directly to 1.8 volts, right? So you do have also one still. Yeah. When the button's not pressed, that's when you don't know what's going on. Yeah. Now it's floating and it could read a lot of different things depending on the electrostatic envi environment. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, if the button fails to open, the circuit will be stuck at one. True. Yeah, true. The chip can run in a wide variety of uh, VDD supply voltages. Is that, is that true? Is that false? No, it, it can't. It's really, it runs on whatever voltage it requires. You, that's what you got to give it. Right. Now you can put a regulator in between your input power supply and, and the chip, but, but, but the chip's got to get the right voltage. Right. Is there a now, specific number we should? Yeah. Is there a specific number we should? Um, yeah, you don't have to know the number. I don't remember. I, I can't remember if the chip runs at 0.9 or 1.8. Okay. 
Mm -hmm. I think maybe it's 0.9, but I don't remember. It, 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 I did cover it in one of the slides, but I, I'm not going to ask you that. I, I mean, it'd be interesting to know. <laughs> yeah, so I did cover it. Let me see. Uh, it's somewhere in the PowerPoint slides. Uh, yeah, I do remember you mentioned it. Yeah, I don't, uh, I don't know. Let me see. Maybe I can figure it out. Um, yeah. So I'll look. I think Artrix 7. So um, yeah, here, I'll put this over here so you can see it. I'm pretty sure it's on here. Oh, uh, maybe I didn't. This is, this is, is it a 1.5? Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I let, let me let's maybe just Google it. Let's see what yeah, it's. Yeah, I'll figure it out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we'll say Google. Well, oh, about the final, has anyone? Um, asked about dates or anything or is that just me that emailed you <laughs> say again uh, i emailed you about the final yesterday about um yeah yeah it, it'll be all day oh, okay is it gonna be this week or are you gonna do it next week still so i i guess i'll i if everybody was cool with doing it this week i i'd, I'd do it this week um yeah. but i but then it's kind of you know it's kind of awkward to do have some students take it this week and some students right. so the the actual schedule time probably doesn't really mean anything but the, yeah. but i think it's i think the schedule day i forget it's the eighth or the ninth or something i can't remember on the 11th which was like that last oh, day okay yeah and i hate that maybe yeah. I'll, maybe i'll send out an email and, and and if there's a preponderance of students that want to do it early I'll, I'll do it i'll do it this week or early next or something Okay. Yeah. I, I hated the fact it was like on the last day of finals. I was like, oh man. <laughs> yeah. It's a problem. Yeah. I thought more students would have talked to you about it on Monday. But... So the cr critical error for most FPAJ core voltages are between 0.5 and 0.9 when the internal logic blocks are initialized to valid operating states, uh, power solutions. So, yeah, so it looks like, yeah, so it looks like, looks like 0.5 to 0.9. Mm -hmm. okay. So I actually don't know that those are some, yeah, okay, I'm, yeah. Too much information. All right. Um, so let's see. The, uh, the circuit will not work for a short period of time after power up. That's true. Why is that true? I know this answer. Oh, man. OK. Uh, it, it has to be something with the, um, oh, man. I have this written in my notes and everything too. I know this. Is. So, so where's the where's the programming information stored on the chip? What, what kind of storage? Oh. So is this does having this, just brain fart right now? I know this answer. <laughs> so does this trip use flash? There you go. Yes, yes. And then we used EE prom or something like that, right? No, the chip uses RAM. RAM. Okay. Is RAM volatile or non-volatile? Volatile, correct. So when you power it down, what happens to the program, your bit file? It doesn't like save it through, it is gone. Yeah. So, so how does it get back in there? You can't. When you power it up, you have to put it back, right? Right. And so there's a lot of different ways of doing that, including you can store it in a flash memory on 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 the printed circuit board. And there's circuitry built into the FPGA to self-program it with a with a nearby flash memory or a nearby EE prom. Okay. Or you can download a new bit file from a from a server that's connected with an IEEE or uh, all sorts of different ways you can do it. 
Okay. But but you have to have some way to reprogram it. Right, right. And that reprogramming takes some time. If you have a if you use a parallel interface and a really fast uh, memory of or EEPROM or fast something or other, then you you can maybe get it. It's, it takes about thirty uh, megabytes a program. You can do it pretty fast. Maybe they talk about in under a second. And they actually provide for encryption and a bunch of other things. Okay, so the EE prom and the flash is there to help you to like basically program the chip. Yeah, so the EE prom and the flash are not inside of the FPGA. No. Okay, yeah, but They're just separate in general. chips. Right. And you could but put them on the board or maybe not. You can, okay. you know, it, you, you, when you design a printed circuit board to support this chip, you have to think about how you're going to program it at power up time. Where are you going to store the bit file? Okay. So if you if you have a system, if it's a pretty good sized system, it may have a disk drive and a and a microprocessor elsewhere. You could right. go ahead and let that let it, let it store the file in the disk drive. But if you if you don't have other feet, you know, if you don't have those things built into your system and you have this chip hosted somehow, then you're going to have to provide some other solution, which it could be, it could be a flash memory on the printed circuit board connected okay. appropriately to the FPGA. And then the FPGA will, will uh, take the, the information off that flash drive or that, that flash memory and load it into the FPGA. And then once it's loaded, then it starts executing its, its, its it starts running with its configuration. Okay, okay. So, but that's why the circuit won't work for a short period of time after power up you, because you have to have, there has to be programmed and that, that takes some time. Right. At least a second, maybe and more. And we have static RAM on our boards. Yeah, the boards have the, the, pro, the actual bit file when the chip is working is stored in static RAM. Right, okay, gotcha, gotcha. Generally, you want to use the internal clock module to save money. True. So there really, uh, there really isn't per se an internal clock module. That's more of a microprocessor thing. So oh, right. we instantiate our own. Okay. Yeah. So if you look at the printed circuit board, it it has an external clock that generates a square wave at 100 megahertz. Right. And that goes in on the clock pin. Okay. Okay. And and uh, and that's which is I forget the number of the clock pin, but but. Uh, it goes in on one of the pins, but that it is a dedicated pin. It is a dedicated, it is an identified clock line. Okay. Uh, but generally, so by ca bypass caps are required. Yeah, there's lots of bypass caps on this chip. Because you think about it, it's running at say 0.5 to 0.9 volts. Doesn't take much of a static spike to, you know, to, be a one, right? Not even a volt, right? Probably something like 0. 0.5 or six will do it, maybe mm -hmm. less. Okay, let's see. So we have this little always block here. Uh, so what is this? A sequential, or is that what you're asking? Sequential. No, what what device am, am I looking at here? Um, and, and so we have, so what do we have? So we have, it's an always block. So I haven't defined the signal. So that's a little awkward, but uh, I have S1, S2, and then I0, I1, I2, and I3. So it should be kind of a little bit of a hint that it's a multiplexer, four to, uh, four to one mux. Four to one, okay. These are our select lines and here are the inputs. And, but the, the output is called out but it's not in the port list because obviously it's an output. So it's not gonna trigger execution of the always block because it's only gonna change when the always block changes it. Because this, this is not a top level module, right? Okay, right, right, right. All okay. right, so, so what results will be encountered with this code? So the always block will result in combinational code. True. So do you see any edge signals up here? No. Yeah, so that's your first clue. Right. No edge signals, very unlikely to be sequential. 
Right. So it should be combinational. It should be combinational whenever you don't, whenever you have no edge signals. And, and remember, in Vivado, you have to have all edge signals or all level signals. Okay. So it, yeah, so it's combinational. And then since you recognize it's a MUX, you know a MUX is combinational. It's not a sequential device. Mm, There's no right. flip flop in a MUX. There's no state machine. Gotcha. It's just it's just a logic expression, really, right? I right. I I zero equals uh, S one. Uh, S1 prime, S0 prime, I1 equals S1 prime, S0, I2 equals S1, S0 prime, and I3 equals I, S1, S0. I mean, well, I shouldn't say it like that, but uh, but the output out equals uh, those terms, I0 anded with S1 prime, S0 prime, uh, I1 anded with S1 prime, S0, I2 anded with S1, S0 prime, and I3 ended with S1, S0. That equation generates the output. No, no state machine, right? Right. Uh, the out will be a net after synthesis. So it has to be defined as a register to be on the left side in this always block, mm -hmm. but it won't synthesize as a register because this will be interpreted by the synthesizer as combinational logic and so because it's combinational logic, out would have to be uh, would have to really be a wire, right? Okay. So so it'll actually turn out as a wire, even though you you'll get, you'll have to call it a, a register for this to pass the syntax. Gotcha. gotcha. An unattended latch will be generated. What do you think? Is this going to give us an unattended latch or no? Yes. It. Well, no. so do you see any condition? Is there any, is there any, have we completely specified all, have we defined the output for all conditions of S1 and S0, I0, I1, I2, and I3? No. <coughs> I yeah. S1, where, oh, I see, okay, if S1 began, all right, yeah, yeah, yes, 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 yes. Reading the whole problem. <laughs> yeah, it's it's fully defined, <laughs> so it's, it's fully specified. So shouldn't shouldn't generate a latch. The same resulting code can be generated with the question mark semicolon operator, or with a logic expression. That's for a specific kind of um, combinational logic, right? The question mark semicolon. Yeah, you remember that? So you, you say F equals such and such question mark, yeah. true and if true, colon if false. Okay, so this so, is true, you could do this. Right? Yeah, and this this doesn't have to appear in an always block, right? That, that, that in fact, it's not supposed to appear in an always block. Right. It's, it's just in a assignment statement. Okay, yeah, yeah, I remember using this. And and so this this is essentially a multi uh, essentially a one bit a, a two to one mux essentially is what it is, okay. but you can nest it. Mm -hmm. You can put you can put these operators inside the operators, so you can make it whatever you want by nesting them, <clears throat> and you could just write the logic expression that I basically verbally said earlier. Right. right. F equals the 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 SOP expression, you know. Uh, S0 prime or S1 prime, S0 prime, I0 plus S, so, you know, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> All right. Um, look at these lines of code. Line two shows an in inertial delay. So that would be this one. That's true. Initially, yeah. it's going to be before this. Yeah, it's true. A and C will be updated at the same time if B changes permanently from zero to one. Mm, if, if A changes, then A and C will be updated if B changes. True. True. That's right. The signal B was initially zero and then one for 500 picoseconds and then back to zero. A does not change. True or false? And of course, this is in simulation only. <coughs> hmm? That's true. Should yeah. I okay. The signal B was initially zero and then one for 500 picoseconds and then back to zero. C does not change. C doesn't change. 
No, C does because it's a transport delay and transport delays uh, don't filter out signals shorter than the transport delay. They just delay them. Right, okay. Inertial delays filter out, they delay, but they also filter out anything that's shorter than the delay. Right, okay. Because okay. what the inertial delay talk, describes is the time it takes for the gate to respond. And if mm -hmm. the signal is shorter than the response time, then, then the gate theoretically won't change the output. Okay. The transport delay is just how long the wire is connecting from the gate to the next thing. Okay. And the information is going to go down the wire regardless. It's just delayed by the length of the wire. Right. Okay. Okay. Signal B, yeah. Uh, a two input NAND gate and R gate are inputs are zero X as the two inputs. What is the output of the NAND gate if you have a zero and an X as an input? Can, so it's is it one or zero or you don't know or can't specify? Oh, a NAND gate that should be one. That's right. It's a one. Okay. Because <laughs> since one of the inputs is zero, the the AND gate would output a zero, and the inverter would flip it to a one. Right. Okay. What's the output of, of the R gate? That should be a one as well. So you have zero and X as the inputs. It's not one for the OR gate. Did you put in a one anywhere? Oh no, you put in a zero and an X. So then, what do you get out? Do you get out a zero or an X or can't specify? Oh, uh, you get a zero? No, because no? X could be a one. So you can't specify. <laughs> no, you can specify it's going to be X. How? Okay, could you could you explain that one a little bit more? So X means that it's uninitialized or unknown. So, right. the, so the idea is it could, it, it, it could, it's some value potentially. And so that value is not known to you, but it is known to the system potentially, or right. I mean, it does exist. So it would be the X. Gotcha. Gotcha. I, I don't know. I mean, it's sort of a can't specify, but it's really an X because it, it's, it's, X. <laughs> yeah, it's gonna, specify X, right? <laughs> yeah. If you knew what X was, you could specify it. Gotcha, gotcha. All right, and then uh, forget this one. Might, <laughs> might have mucks two different ways, but anyway, okay. So that's pretty much it. Is All right. Gonna, do you think that's going to be on the final to like write the mucks like in the one line? Yeah. That you have to do something like that. Yeah, and uh, no, I I don't think I'll ask that. It's going to be pretty much short answer, multiple choice, uh, little numeric answer, or true false. Okay. Right. Just like the past three, four reviews that you've done. Yeah, all the it's going to be very similar to the post te, post quiz tests. Okay, sounds good. Sounds good. So, and I actually I may go back and I may pull in some of those questions. But okay. although they, I know there, a lot of people told me that the quizzes were hard. Really? I hmm. mean, I, I took the quizzes like right after I watched your video, and I mean, usually it, I think there was like two or three that was like that 75 but other than that it was pretty much straightforward like if I, I think if you took it right after watching your video it's like basically something you asked in that video you know? yeah I tried to make it that way right right well maybe you're just smarter than the average bear I don't know <laughs> oh man I wish <laughs> oh wow huh. it's a lot come from you Dr. Morgan <laughs> well that's okay <laughs> <laughs> all right this was recorded the whole time so all these students are just going to hear a side conversation that's great but yeah i didn't realize it was recorded i'm like oh man this is like an hour video now huh yeah well that's okay <laughs> uh, hopefully they'll find it interesting oh, hopefully <laughs> all right okay all right nice to see you Sherilyn. <clears throat> so so i'll probably offer a help session i'm i'm gonna go in if somebody needs to come in and get help i'll be there at two and online, right? On Zoom? No, I'll go into UTSA. I'll be oh. there in the lab. Oh, I thought we were not allowed into to UTSA anymore. You know, I thought so too, but we were there We were there Monday, so, and I, they were there yesterday. I didn't go in yesterday, but I had okay. too many. I My daughter bought a house, and we had to go to the closing because okay. we were going to help her with the house, but anyway. <laughs> Are you going to have any live sections or anything? Because I'll, I'll Yeah, I will. I will. Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll do... Uh, I'll, I'll send out an email and schedule some. 
Okay, I'll, I'll put it in the group me because usually what happens, especially with the Monday morning meeting, everybody in the group me was like, oh, there's a meeting, there's a meeting. I don't think anyone realized or forgot about today's meeting. Yeah. So I'll put it out there that like, oh, we just had one. There is going to be a live session. Yeah. 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 Well, <laughs> that, I'll, I'm, I'll post the video so they can watch it. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Later on. Yes. You have a great one. Okay. Bye. You too. Mm -hmm. Bye bye.